be uh, uh, very pedagogical in this, uh, in this uh, topic. So and at the end, I will present also some results from our own research. Now, uh, well, the topic is, you know, is, is, is dealing with energy, and this slide shows uh, the consumption of uh, various uh, sources of energy in the 50 years from 1990 to 2014. And you see there is no sign that uh, uh, natural gas or petroleum and oil are going to be uh, to decrease in the consumption. There is, a, uh, there is a, a decrease in the use of coal and of course uh, an increase in the use of renewables. But uh, still for many years to go, many decades, we have to rely on fossil fuels, which of course uh, uh, opens a big problem because we know that this has uh, a lot of consequences for the climate. And these two uh, graphs show simply what happened in the 50 years uh, from uh, uh, 1950 to 2000. There has been an increase in the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere of about 100 ppm, which is in such a short time is a huge increase. Now, we know uh, that we have to reduce CO2 uh, in the atmosphere, but we know also that we are going to produce more CO2 in the next decades. So uh, things will not change, will not improve, uh, until we will find a way to use the uh, CO2, which is in the atmosphere, as a raw material to produce new chemicals and new substances. So it is uh, not enough to reduce the emissions. We really have to find out a way to make something out of this CO2, which has been produced and will be produced in the next decades. So I think this is a, I'm saying this really uh, as a strong statement. This is a, a, a key issue in the society, but you never heard the discussion about this in the news or in the media or whatever. Everybody's talking, we have to reduce emissions, but nobody says what we have to do and how we can, we can do that. Now, uh, the, the idea in principle, or idea, the chemically the process is relatively simple because in principle you can take CO2 and you let it react with three moles, one mole of CO2 and three moles of hydrogen, and you can produce methanol and water. Methanol is a fuel, is, is an alcohol. It can, be far, it can be further converted, but it's already a very big step forward having a, solar, having a fuel. This process, however, uses a lot of hydrogen. And of course, the hydrogen has to be produced also in a sustainable way, in a renewable way. Well, nowadays, and we'll come back to that point, uh, hydrogen is produced industrially in very large amounts, but is produced from fossil fuels with a process which is called steam reforming. And also this process is not at all easy. There is only one plant in, in the world which produces methanol starting from CO2. It has been uh, opened in 2014. It is based on a catalyst, which is uh, a copper on zinc oxide. And it relies on geothermal energy. It has been done in Iceland because you need a lot of energy in order to uh, make this reaction occur. And this is what is called thermal catalysis. So you put, you put the energy that you require for the conversion <coughs> using an, exter an external source of energy. Now, why is so difficult this kind of process? And why is it so difficult to convert CO2 in something useful, in something like a solar fuel? Well, that is, is illustrated in this di uh, diagram because CO2 is the most stable form of carbon when you can combine with oxygen. It's the lowest energy state. So thermodynamics bring you to CO2. And then if you want to make hydrogenated compounds like formic acid, formaldehyde, methanol, or even worse, methane from CO2, you have to put a lot of energy. And this is something that is an unav unavoidable. Now we are at the conferences of people who think that Earth is flat. That's good. We are not yet people who think that uh, you, you can go against the second term, uh, principle of thermodynamics, but we could try to do that and see if uh, people, there, we, we could have many followers. Now, in order to do this, you have to be, this obeys thermodynamics. There is no way, there is no way out. So the problem is converting CO2 in fuels uh, uh, with a lot of energy. Of course, one could say, well, but look, this is something which happens in nature. Because in nature, you take carbon dioxide and water, 
And uh, with this fantastic system, which is photosynthesis, natural, natural photosynthesis, you can convert this in glucose and, and oxygen. And since somebody asked me, I'm sure he was going to talk about natural photosynthesis, I will not address the complexity of this process, which however occurs in nature, and this is a, is a, is a result of million years of evolution. Now, of course, people are trying to design what is called the artificial photosynthesis. So it is basically to construct molecular complexes which mimic the natural uh, process and uh, in order to convert CO2 into glucose or hydrogenated carbons. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that somebody is going to address this. Now, the point, however, that if you want to uh, find an, a, a, a source of energy to convert CO2 into fuels, we have to use light, or we can, can try to use light. And this brings to the topic of photocatalysis. Because the idea, uh, which I will illustrate in some more depth, is uh, very simple. To use light uh, actually to generate, to separate electrons uh, and holes. Holes is when you have an atom, you, you remove an electron and you create a positive charge. And so holes are positive charges which are separated by electrons. These holes and electrons can migrate on the surface of, an, of a particle and react with chemical species. When this happens, you may produce new chemicals. So this is the idea, which is again very simple. Uh, and uh, photocatalysis can be used for two main, uh, in two main directions. Because you can use this idea of capturing light and generating the electrons and holes. On one side, for, to, to produce what is called environmental catalysis. What is this? Well, you generate these electrons and souls. You have species which are pollutants, which are in the air or in water. And you use these electrons and holes to transfer them to these molecules and induce chemical reactions and remove the pollutants. This is relatively easy because uh, uh, you want to go in the direction that thermodynamics suggests. So you want to reconvert. Uh, molecules which are, uh, for instance, toxic into CO2. In this case, you want to produce CO2 because this CO2 molecule is not is harm, harmful for us. So we can use this to uh, eliminate pollutants. And it's relatively simple because it occurs with a single charge transfer. You can transfer one electron or you can transfer a whole. And you start and you produce radical species. And these radical species further react. Much more complicated is to basically use the same principle, generate electrons and holes, to produce fuels, hydrogen or methanol or methane, from CO2 and water. Because you need multiple charge transfers, and you need to go against thermodynamics. So there are two fields which are both based on uh, photoactive materials. One is environmental photocatalysis, and one is uh, production of uh, fuels from solar energy. Now, everybody is familiar, most, many people are familiar with this di diagram, but still I have to basically illustrate it because it is the basic of everything. Uh, so again, what happens when you have a nanoparticle, this can be an oxide nanoparticle, can be one of the most popular oxides, I will talk about this TiO2, but is in water. You have light, visible light, uh, or solar light, you generate electrons and holes. How you generate electrons and holes? Because the material has some occupied states, the valence band, and you excite an electron into the empty states, the conduction band. So the first requirement is that this jump, this transition, has to occur in the visible range of light. First requirement. Is that sufficient to make useful things? No. Because then you need that the electron uh, has to be transferred to a proton in water, and the proton is reduced to hydrogen. And so you, have, you can induce the reduction of hydrogen or protons to hydrogen only if this electron is above the redox potential of water. And this is a second requirement. So the position of the conduction band has to be above this line. 
Then you have the holes. What can you do with the holes? Water, uh, in water, oxygen is in a reduced state, is formally O2 minus. You generate an hole in the valence band because you have excited an electron. One electron is transferred back to the valence band, or if you want, the hole migrates to the oxygen. And you form an you know, O minus species, and then O species, and from O species, you form O2. You oxidize water. But this, this can only occur if the valence band of a semiconductor is below this threshold. And this is the third requirement. And you see, you need something which already has three requirements. And then if you generate this electron and the hole, they have to migrate. And they have to migrate to the surface of the nanoparticle. And in the process of migrating with electrons and holes, they can recombine. They can come together and basically fill the hole, the electron fills the hole, and the process is stopped. And this is the fourth requirement. You need a low recombination rate, otherwise you lose most of your electron hole pairs. So this is the basic. And how can we follow this process? Well, I'm not going to talk much about this uh, uh, particular technique, which is called electron uh, paramagnetic resonance or electron spin resonance. But you can follow the spin of electrons with this technique. And if you take, for instance, a TiO2, which is a typical semiconductor, and uh, you take the spectrum uh, and in, 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 uh, in dark, there is no signal, then you irradiate your sample, and you see there is a new signal, this signal, which indicates the formation of O minus. O minus is a radical. It has an unpaired electron. Or you excite the electron into the conduction band, and you form a titanium 3 plus ion, Again, you have one unpaired electron, titanium, and you have another signal. So with this spectroscopy, you can clearly see the generation of electrons and holes during your um, excitation process. OK, now, so if, if we have a, the right semiconductor, we can start of thinking of producing uh, uh, solar fuels. And hydrogen is the first of solar fuels. Uh, of course, uh, many years ago, 20 years ago, there was a lot. Uh, if you go back in the newspapers, you will find that everybody was expecting the hydrogen car. In Milano, they wanted to build a, a, a gas station for, uh, for hydrogen station. We still have the, the area. And everybody was convinced that hydrogen would have been the future. Actually, that was not the case. Uh, hydrogen economy would be fantastic because, of course, we could uh, produce hydrogen from water. And, uh, and then uh, use it in, in uh, storage and use it for transportation and then uh, use it in combustion and we regenerate the water. So it's a very clean process. Today, all the hydrogen which is produced doesn't come from splitting of water. It comes from steam reforming. So huge amounts of uh, uh, oil or natural gas are converted at very high temperature for instance, methane plus water, you form CO plus hydrogen. CO further reacts with water, and you form CO2 plus hydrogen. So when we produce hydrogen today, we produce CO2 in the same way, and we consume fossil fuels. And I, I, I visit one of these plants, for instance, in, in Ludwigshafen, where Bayer has his huge chemical plant, seven kilometers wide, two kilometers large, so in immense. And the first step they do is steam reforming. They produce a huge amount of hydrogen because hydrogen is needed, for instance, to produce ammonia, which is another very important chemical reaction to produce fertilizers. So this is a problem. Today, we all, all the hydrogen is produced for, in this way. Of course, you can produce this also biologically, but the efficiency is, is low. Or, and here we come to the topic, photochemically and uh, photogeneration. So you can use, uh, for instance, in a semiconductor, TiO2, and you have light coming in, and you generate these electrons and holes, and you uh, uh, can produce oxygen on one side and hydrogen on the other side. And you can go to the web, you can find uh, many nice movies that show very clearly you just uh, need a uh, this catalyst and you put it in water and you see the bubbles of hydrogen and oxygen uh, coming out. The problem is that the efficiency is very, is very low. Now, this brings to the first problem. Which are the catalysts that we can use for this process? Which are the materials? 
Now, the first observations and, and a lot of literature is about titanium dioxide, TiO2. Well, if you go to the, again to the history, uh, you, you will find out that TiO2 is used since a century because it was used as an additive to paints already in 1920. And already in 1920, people realized that because it, it, it um, improves the optical properties of the paint. So here there is a lot of TiO2 in this, in this paint. But what also was, uh, was uh, recognized at that time, that exactly because TiO2 is photoactive, after some, some times it was inducing what is called chalking. So under sunlight, it can deteriorate the paint because in the paint you have also some uh, organic uh, component. And in 1921, there were first report uh, that TiO2 can interact with li uh, light and can induce, in this particular case, a reduction of TiO2. And you can find very accurate studies about the photoactivity of titanium dioxide in 19. 30s and 40s. So it's nothing new, let's say. It's quite well known. And uh, the first report of the possible production of water, uh, sorry, of hydrogen from water electrolysis is from 1972. And coming back to the talk I gave yesterday, is an interesting paper to read because it was less than two pages long, five references. <coughs> It is now highly cited. I think such a paper today will not go through uh, the pre-review process because almost nothing is written in this paper. They simply said, we suggest that water can be decomposed by visible light into oxygen and hydrogen without application of any external voltage. So it was very, very interesting paper, but it's, it's very simple. But this is the idea. So the idea is not new. And after 50 years, we are still debating what can be done and why it is not so efficiently done. Well, I was telling you that the, the four requirements, and uh, this is TiO2. TiO2 has two uh, structures, rutile or anatase. In both cases, the, the band gaps, so the excitation, is between 3 and 3.2 electron volts. And if you look at the solar spectrum, you realize that the number of visible light photons in the, coming from the sun is just a very small fraction. So with this material, we can only use this very little amount of photons, which are able to excite electrons from the valence band to the conduction band. This is the first drawback. It is, um, it is the first problem. Of course, you can say, well, let's move out from TiO2. Let's take another semiconductor. And, and of course, there are tables, and, and, and theoreticians have done a lot of work in this field. You can compute or can you measure the properties of the various semiconductors and they remember however the second requirement um, TiO2 has a good band gap as a band gap which is a bit too large it has a good position of the conduction band which is above the water reduction potential or of the valence band which is below the oxygen oxidation potential uh, but of course there are other uh, semiconductors with smaller band gaps so they absorb more visible light but for instance, the position of a conduction band is too low, or the condition of a balance band is too high. And you can also have materials which on paper are perfect. They have the right band gap and the right position of the uh, balance band and conduction band. So why are they not using them? Well, first of all, you have to measure the real photo efficiency. And if you measure the real photo efficiency, which means how many uh, molecules of hydrogen that we are producing per photon or how much photo current we are generating with uh, irradiation. Well, for instance, you see TiO2 is here, very low efficiency for the reasons that I mentioned to you. You may have better materials, but you have, it's not enough to have the right position of a conduction band and valence band and band gap. You have the recombination. And the recombination reduces severely the efficiency and recombination as I told you can occur and this was there was a very beautiful lecture yesterday by Giulio Cerullo so essentially can it occurs in two ways uh, you can either uh, recombine electrons and also uh, generate photons so it is emission of photons or you just have non-radiative recombination and you just 
<laughs> increase the vibrational modes of your lapis. But even if you have the right material with the right band gap and the low recombination, is that solve the problem? No, you need also materials which are stable in uh, uh, working conditions, which means liquids at various pH. So uh, you need a material which uh, does not dissolve when the pH becomes too acid or too basic. So this is st the stability of the semiconductor is, is a very important issue. And that's why PTIO2 is so much used, because it's stable, it's uh, non-toxic, uh, basically it has a number of properties. And so people started to say, okay, let's follow another way. Let's take materials which are, I mean, not ideal, but a good starting point, and modify them, for instance, by doping. And uh, so let's see what can you do with doping. So the idea of doping, doping means when you have a material and you add an heteroatom, whatever. It can be a metal, it can be a non-metal. And the, this atom can enter either in the lattice, replacing one of the existing atoms, or can go in interstitial positions. That depends very much on the synthesis. And it's not the same, but of course, this is just one possible thing. And what happens when you dope your material? Okay, here is a, a very important conceptual illustration. This is the starting material. You have a valence band, you have a conduction band, and you have a given absorption of light. No absorption if you are below the threshold, and then you have absorption. Now you introduce a dopant. The dopant can introduce a level in the band gap. And then you can excite from this state to the conduction band, and this can be done in visible light much more efficiently. Or you can introduce an empty level in the band gap, and you can, you can excite from here to here. So these are all phenomena which are absent in the pristine material. And if you have this kind of situation, you start to see that the absorption occurs at lower energy. So you start to have uh, to capture photons of visible light. There is another possibility, however, that by doping the material and changing the electronic structure, you just shift. You notice that this band is shift to higher energy. So you move the entire band and you reduce the band gap. In that case, you have simply a shift of the entire absorption. Let me anticipate that this is really what we would like to have, to modify the valence band and move the entire band. Unfortunately, what, this is what happens in most cases, and I will be more specific about that. So there is another problem, and this is a typical, if you want, a problem which excites theoreticians like me, but I think it also has a lot of consequences, which, is, which has to do with the localization. We generate an electron and a hole. Now, this is, this is a picture which shows, for instance, there is an electron in the conduction band. So you have excited your electron. The electron can be delocalized. What does it mean? It belongs to the entire lattice. It is these yellow signs which are basically spread over all atoms. Or it can be localized. What does it mean? It is sitting on a single ion. And you see that there is, there is a distortion of a lattice around it. Well, the, when you have this localization, you gain energy. We gain energy, and this is called a polaron. It's a polaronic state. The lattice distorts in order to trap the electron and localize it. Well, you realize that two situations are quite different. Here is an electron in a specific site. Here is an electron which is spread over the entire material. And in terms of conductivity, this is a really a quite a lot of consequences. The same occurs for the hole. You can generate a hole. So you can form a single hole. And you see this is a typical shape of a p orbital of an oxygen atom in the valence band, which can be localized or can be delocalized. But again, the localization leads to a stabilization of a system and to the formation of a polar. Now, the nature, the localized or delocalized nature of electrons and holes is crucial in this kind of processes. And this brings me to the topic of theory. I will not speak of, of, of theory of these um, systems, just a few general, very general concepts. Of course, nowadays, most of uh, electronic structure calculations are based on what is called density functional theory, and I have no time to go through it. But the only message I want to give to an audience, which I guess probably is mostly of experimentalists, is that 
there are many variants of density functional theory. They are not all the same. And uh, there is a hierarchy of accuracy in the methods that you are using. And uh, this problem of localization or delocalization critically depends on the level of theory that you are using to describe your material. The most general, most classical uh, approaches are the so-called LDA or GGA functionals, which are used. But if you really want to describe properly this phenomena and the localization of electrons and holes, you have to go to higher levels, in particular to what are called the hybrid functionals, which are more or less in, at this level in this ladder. Now, the, let me give you an example of what I, what I am trying to describe. Uh, this is again a case of TiO2. This is absorption band of TiO2, which, uh, as we have seen, starts to absorb about 3 V. If you dope with metal, with transition metal, iron, tungsten, chromium, or vanadium, you have to start to you start to absorb at uh, uh, higher wavelengths, which means lower energy photons. Now, why is that? If you do a calculation with an LDA or GGA function, so you take, for instance, chromium-doped TiO2, which means uh, you put a chromium instead of a titanium in the lattice. What happens? You have a valence band, you have a conduction band, and you have a new states which are due to this chromium dopant. If you look at this picture, it looks like you have a small band, which would be good. <coughs> band it means you have, a, you have a spread of values actually, which is crossed by the Fermi level. But this picture is incorrect. And uh, this would lead to a delocalized nature of electrons. Why, in, 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 in reality, the electrons are strongly localized. And we have strong localization. These levels have different positions in the, in the band gap. For instance, they are very close to the, conduct, to the valence band. And the fact that you have localized electrons also is a detrimental for the photoactivity because these are very good trapping sites. And so you increase recombination rates. So the localization is negative for the properties of the material. But only the right theory can describe properly this. And this is another example. This is a, 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 because what I show you was doping with a transition metal. In 2001, there has been an explosion of interest towards doping TiO2 with non-metal atoms, like nitrogen. And this was stimulated by, by a paper published in Science by Azai and co-workers. The paper is now more than 9,000 citations. What they did, uh, they, they were talking of uh, environmental photocatalysis, not of fuel production, but uh, what they were showing is the following. If you take TiO2, either pure TiO2 or nitrogen doped TiO2, under UV light, not visible light, UV photons, well, it, it has a high efficiency in degrading uh, pollutants. However, if you take visible light, the normal TiO2 is non-active. Basically, there is no conversion. While the nitrogen-doped TiO2 is very active because you start to absorb photon of visible light. Beautiful. They also provided a theoretical explanation of this. And the explanation was based, according to, in, uh, at that time, to non-state-of-the-art calculations, but basically showing that you had this effect. You had this broadening of a band, of a valence band, and the reduction of a band gap, which would be fantastic. That was the prediction. Well, first of all, let me mention that nitrogen doped TiO2 had been studied in 1986 by Sato, but nobody realized that. And he published exactly the same results 15 years before. And uh, this is the paper by Azai in Science, going, going back to the, uh, the distortions of modern science. The paper of Sato never got cited until 2000, when this paper appeared. Somebody rediscovered that paper, and that paper got cited 15 years after it was, it was published. But it's essentially the same concept that was reported in, in the paper by Sato. Now, why, why there is a, uh, what is the problem here? OK, let me uh, open another, another issue. This is TiO2. Again, the band gap is about 3.3 3 EV. Oxide semiconductors are never perfect. You always have defects. Defects, for instance, vacancies, oxygen vacancies. 
So uh, it, we are very hard to be, to be prepared in a fully stoichiometric way. So what happens if you remove an oxygen atom from the TiO2? The oxygen 2 minus is uh, remove an oxygen, and there are two electrons remains in the material. And they are located in states which are close to the conduction band, here, more or less. So high in the gap. Why this is relevant when you dope the material? Because you dope with nitrogen, and nitrogen introduces a state which is close to the valence band, so low in the gap. And you have oxygen vacancies which introduce states, states high in the, in the gap, close to the conduction band. So what happens? Naturally, these electrons is transferred to this state. And you <coughs> form a new state which is doubly occupied. Notice that this is paramagnetic, single electron. This is diamagnetic, two electrons. Why this is important? OK, first of all, the, 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 the first message is when you dope a material, uh, is, there is a, is a huge field. You never have a single dopant which introduces a single level. There is a lot of possible interactions with other uh, phenomena that occur in the same material. In this case, nitrogen doping, for instance, strongly favors the formation of oxygen vacancies because it lowers the cost and you form this kind of species. And this was clearly demonstrated uh, uh, some time ago with my colleague Elio Giamello, an experimentalist in Torino, because if you irradiate these samples with uh, uh, visible light, you have diamagnetic centers, because N with uh, nitrogen with one extra electron is diamagnetic. You excite electrons into the conduction band. These electrons become active, and you generate paramagnetic uh, states, which can be detected by APR. Now, this study was very important because it demonstrated quite clearly that these states are completely localized and not delocalized, contrary to the picture that was presented in science. And since then, we did a lot of uh, systematic work on the various dopants that you can have in TiO2, boron, carbon, and nitrogen, fluorine, and all the dopants introduce localized states. So you may have a very high, uh, states which are in the middle of the gap. You reduce the absorption. That is beautiful from the point of view of the absorption properties. That is not so nice from the point of view of the recombination problem. OK, I, this doesn't mean that doping is useless. Uh, there is a lot of work um, which is still do, uh, being, doing, being, being done on doping and co-doping. But of course, let's move to another way of improving our activity, which is heterojunctions. Uh, uh, Giulio Cerullo has been talking yesterday about uh, junction, combining graph graphene with uh, 2D materials and so on. The, the idea is the same. You can do it with uh, semiconductors. Again, it's not a new idea. I'm not sure this is the, new, the first, uh, first paper. Michael Gretzel proposed this in 1984. But the idea is very simple. You take two materials now, two semiconductors. You put them together. Um, and of course, uh, the idea is the following. You excite one semiconductor, so you generate holes and, the, uh, and, and electrons. The electrons, however, are in con since you are in contact with another semiconductor, the electrons can move to this side. On the other end, you have uh, this uh, hole uh, here, which basically is filled by this semiconductor. And if, if you want, this electron moves down, and, you generate, and the hole move, moves in this direction. So the electron moves on the left, the hole moves on the right, and you separate electrons and holes. And separating the electrons and holes, you avoid recombination. This is a beautiful idea. And, uh, and of course, it works partly. There are various kind of uh, hetero junctions, and uh, uh, it depends on the position of the levels, but that is more technical. And, uh, and, uh, and, and an idea which is even more uh, sophisticated, and which partly go back to the natural photosynthesis, is to you, you take two semiconductors with different position of the band gaps. But you put in between a chemical redox system. What, that, what does it mean, a chemical redox system? You have one material where, where you basically generate the electrons, and the electrons are consumed by this redox. And you generate holes, and the holes are used for your reaction on one side. On the other side, you generate the holes, which are consumed by the redox couple. 
and the electrons are used for the reaction on the opposite side. Again, is engineering the system in such a way that you keep as far apart as possible electrons and holes to avoid recombination. This is called Z, Z scheme. And so this is the general frame. And now, depending on how much time is left, I will describe some practical results and, uh, taken from our own work, also to show you how things go when you go from theory to praxis. Um, I'm I will discuss uh, the case of basically mixing uh, semiconducting or insulating oxides like ceria with zirconia and zinc oxide. Uh, there is an experimental part, which is not my part. I will mention that it's done again in the group of Edio Giamello. But, uh, okay, if you, they, so in the first part, I will show what happens if you mix serum dioxide with zirconia. In the second part, if you mix serum oxide with zinc oxide. So we have the same component mixed with two different oxides. Notice that this is a wide gap insulator. Zirconia is a gap of all, uh, 5, uh, 5.5 EV. Zinc oxide is a wide gap semiconductor, 3.4 V. So they are completely inactive in visible light. Um, okay, so these are basically the two uh, compounds. But uh, what uh, the, the, the preparation of the first compound is done by sol gel. Sol gel is a chemical way of producing new materials. And of course, you start the synthesis and you know, don't know exactly what you obtain. And in order to know what you obtain, you have to do a num number of characterizations. And here what happens, this is a, a X-ray diffraction pattern. It shows very clearly that in this synthesis, cerium is entering as a dopant in zirconium dioxide. So it's diluted as a dopant. You don't have segregation of different materials. Well, you have produced a new material. And now the first thing you want to do is to see what is the, re the reactivity or what is the activity in under visible light. As I told you, pristine pure zirconium dioxide is a gap of 5 EV, will never absorb li visible light photons. However, if you dope with cerium, uh, this is the absorption of a pure zirconia, no absorption in visible light. If you have cerium doping, uh, 1 to 5%, uh, you start to absorb light in the visible light region. Um, okay, that's uh, already interesting. It doesn't say much. You have to see what is uh, visible light doing. And you can do this again using electron spin resonance. Because using electron spin resonance, uh, to make the story short, you, you take the spectrum or the different spectrum before and after irradiation, and you see that under visible light, visible light, not UV light, you generate holes and electrons. So clearly, you are exciting. Uh, electrons from valence band to the conduction band of the material. Not only this, but if you now look at what happens at the surface of a nanoparticle, you can uh, react molecules like oxygen. Electrons are trapped by oxygen. You form O2 minus, and O2 minus is again uh, uh, can be seen in electron spin resonance, which means that le the electrons and holes are generated in the nanoparticles. They migrate and they reach the surface. And at the surface, they can react both the electrons and also the holes through a more complicated mechanism, but uh, uh, you can detect the formation of holes. So the message here is, yes, you take a material which has a no absorption visible light, you dope it with cerium, and it becomes active in visible light, and the electrons and holes are generated and reach the surface. Now, what, 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 can be, uh, what, is, what is the mechanism? We, we are not complete, yet completely sure about what can be the me mechanism. What theory tells you is that we do, you do calculations is uh, that, yes, you have a wide gap insulator, but the serial dopant, dopant introduces new states in the middle of the gap. And these new states can act to some extent as uh, as, as, a, as an intermediate position where you, are, you can have a double excitation. So you can excite first to these levels and then from these levels to the conduction bed. I mean, this, uh, we have the, we have the, we, uh, it is not so easy. Now I, have, I don't want to open it, it would be another talk, how to compute excitations in solids, which is uh, uh, not a trivial task. But here we did it for the people, the experts in the audience using the so-called transition, charge transition levels. 
But finally, we compute the transitions, which are uh, 2.5 and 3.1, uh, which are uh, be compatible with visible light absorption, in particular, if you take into account that you have an overestimate of a band gap of about 15%. So the message is, of this first part, sorry, here doping resulted in impurity, in uh, purity atoms, cerium replacing zirconium, in new states in the gap, and uh, a material which has no visible light activity become active in visible light. Now let's take this, the second example, which is again cerium oxide mixed with zinc oxide. The synthesis again, sol gel, so it is basically the same. Uh, you start from precursors and so on. Interestingly enough, the final compound that you get is completely different. There is no longer cerium diluted into zinc oxide, but very clearly the synthesis has produced small aggregates of cerium dioxide, so nanoparticles of cerium dioxide, on nanoparticles of, of zinc oxide. So there is a heterojunction. And this depends on the synthesis, and it's very difficult to, to know a priori what you are going to get. But this is quite clear. You have a number of measures showing this formation of two separate phases, cerium dioxide and zinc oxide. However, interesting enough, also this material becomes slightly active in visible light, in a sort of visible light, more than the pristine material. But more important, under visible light, again, you can follow the generation of O minus species, holes, and uh, in this case, zinc plus ions, electrons in the conduction bed again, using visible light. So the zinc oxide has no absorption in the visible. By mixing or creating an heterojunction, you make the material active in visible light. And uh, why, again, here theory can, produ can, can produce some answer. Um, here what we did, we, we constructed a model of the junction, which is not a trivial thing, because when you have two materials, of course, you have strain. You must have lattice constants of the two phases which match together. Nobody really knows what is at the interface, how the interface is done. And so you have to create a model and hope that it's close to reality because it's not so uh, obvious what happens. But when we constructed this uh, heterojunction and we computed the lowest excitation, the lowest excitation turns out to be much lower than in the two separate materials. And the reason is that now you excite from one component, from zinc oxide, from the valence band, where you generate an O minus, you excite into the other component, and you generate a cerium 3 plus at the interface. So the excitation starts at the interface at much lower energy than in the bulk materials when they are taken taken separately. OK, again, this shows that uh, these electrons and ores in the real material, they reach the surface. They interact with molecules on the surface. So they produce photocatalytic processes. And in fact, this material has been shown to be very active in the degradation of pollutants under visible light. OK, this is basically the summary, or basically what uh, I wanted to show you, that you, you can take, you can modify semiconductors. The, what you get is largely determined by the synthetic procedure, and it's very difficult to know a priori what is going to happen. But I show two examples where you can end up with a real doping case or the formation of an heterojunction. I think still there is a lot of work to be done in this field, which, however, is quite exciting. And I would like to thank uh, my co-workers, uh, and uh, in particular my experimental co-workers, for the part of the talk that I've shown to you. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>